You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome to another program of A Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel, the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Thanks for watching A Bible Answer today. This program is overseen by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee and supported by 33 faithful congregations of the Churches of Christ throughout this region. We're glad you're watching today. We also have three gospel preachers with us to serve as panelists to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Robert Taylor. I'm from Ripley, Tennessee. I do gospel meetings, speak in lectureships, and do a great deal of religious writing. I'm Gary Colley, evangelist of the Getwell Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee, and I also teach for the Memphis School of Preaching. My name is Jimmy Colvett. I preach for the Church of Christ in Matthews, Missouri. We're thrilled to have these brethren with us today to answer your questions. And we have great questions again today. At the halfway point of our program, and again at the end, you'll see our contact information where you can send in your Bible question and we'll seek to answer it on a future program. Now to our questions today. Our first question goes to Brother Jimmy Colvett. The person says, help me to understand Genesis 32, 22 through 31. Did God wrestle with Jacob? Brother Colvin. Thank you for this question. And I don't think we'll take the time to read all of those verses, but it is the record of Jacob wrestling with a man who's identified as a man here in Genesis 32. But in Hosea chapter 12 and verse 4, he's identified as an angel. Probably the angel of the Lord that's mentioned frequently in the Old Testament, who was in all likelihood the Lord Jesus Christ before he came into this world. But be all that as it may, as we read this account, he was wrestling with God. If it was Jesus or the angel was an angelic being, so he was wrestling with God. But there's a long story behind this. We go back into Genesis 25 and Jacob and Esau were born to Isaac and Rebekah. And in time, they, these boys grew up, and Jacob was named this, and that name means supplant, supplanter. And the word supplant means to take by the heel, or to supplant, or to uh, mistreat is the idea in this, to trip up. So as we read this story along from Genesis 25 on for several chapters, we read about Jacob getting the birthright from Esau when Esau came in from hunting or out in the field and was hungry and Jacob was making what I would call soup, you might call it a stew. He was making pottage, the scripture calls it. And Esau was hungry and he wanted this. And so Jacob said he'd give it to him if he'd give him his birthright. Esau said, well, I'm about ready to die, so I might as well. Then after that, Jacob and Rebekah engineered getting the blessing from Isaac upon Jacob instead of Esau. Esau then said later, he supplanted me these two times. Now in the context where the scripture comes from that, that the questioner is interested in, and it's a good question, to help understand this, Jacob had been 
with Laban for over at least 20, maybe more years. And he had come to get a wife from the home of Laban, which was the home of his mother, Rebekah. Laban and Rebekah were brother and sister. And so after all that time in Paden Aram and getting the ch wife and then the, the children, the family, he was headed back home. And he found out that Esau was on the way. Well, this frightened him because he heard that Esau was on the way and with 400 men. That would frighten any of us, wouldn't it? Because Esau was angered with him when he got the blessing, the birthright. He was angered with him and was ready to kill him. Well, then at that point, they sent him away to, to get him a wife in, in Paden Aram. But on the way back, he learned that Esau was coming. And so he sent a gift to Esau, who wanted to reject it at the time, but Jacob wanted him to have it. He was trying to make amends with him. And on the way, he sent the children, the wives, the handmaids, and the children across the river at Jabbok. And that's when he wrestled with the angel. And during this time, he was informed that he was no longer Jacob, but Israel was his name, which means Prince of God. That he has his Prince and power with God. I believe the thing that we can learn that's most important right here is in the process of all of these things that went on, Jacob had become a changed man. And he now even thought of Esau as, as his Lord, even though that was not the case. So he was a changed man, a changed heart. He was different. He was no longer the supplanter, but now a prince of God. I hope that this maybe helps you in your understanding of this. But go back to Genesis 25 and read for several chapters there. And you get this background story. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you, Brother Coffin. And now to Brother Taylor, we have this question. The person says, I was asked by my grandson why I was against gay marriage. I couldn't find it in my Bible. Where is it, please? Brother Taylor. Nobody else can find gay marriage in the Bible. It's something that has happened in our daytime, in our lifetime. And it's a shame that the good and great word gay has now been associated with an homosexual type of thing. God defined marriage in Genesis, the second chapter, namely one man for one woman for a lifetime. Jesus Christ defined marriage in Matthew, the 19th chapter. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall clee or be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God never has joined two men in an approved marriage. He has never, nor will he ever, join two women in a so-called marriage. The Apostle Paul defined marriage in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, going back to Genesis, the second chapter. Marriage is for man and for woman. Adam and Eve, man and woman. Noah and his wife, man and woman. Abraham and Sarah, man and woman. Jacob, or rather Isaac and Rebekah, man and woman. In the New Testament, Joseph and Mary, not two men, not two women, but man and woman. Zacharias and Elizabeth, man and woman. Priscilla and Aquila, man, or rather in this case, woman and man. God has always endorsed the marriage of an eligible man with an eligible woman. These are the two people that he will join together 
This is exactly what uh, Jesus said, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. I would suggest to the grandfather that sent this in, take this as an opportunity to teach your grandson what marriage is and what marriage is not. The five lawyers in Washington, D.C., who just this last year decided that it's perfectly lawful, law lawful and legal for man to be married to man and for woman to be married to woman. The Old Testament uh, calls an, uh, an association or, 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 or joining something like this as an abomination in the sight of God. Marriage has always been between one eligible man and one eligible woman. And those who respect the Bible are going to stay with that. Justin Pascal, our local preacher, teaches a little children's class each Sunday night about five or ten minutes before our regular service. And something that he impresses upon those children is marriage is for man and for woman and for a lifetime. He wants to indelibly stamp that great truth upon these, the pliable hearts uh, of our young people. And I applaud that, applaud that kind of thing. We must not give any ground at all to this modern concept that gay marriage, as it is so-called, is permissible and acceptable and approved on the sight of God. It definitely is not. You, the grandfather, will never find gay marriage in the Bible. It's not there. Thank you for the good question. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer you a free tract. Actually, our tract today is in the shape of a bookmark, and it's entitled Quick Scriptures for Teens. If you'd like to have this bookmark for your teenagers, or if you'd like to receive our free A-Lesson Bible Correspondence Course on the Church of the Bible, all you have to do is contact us, and you may do that by writing us at Philip Street Church of Christ, 912 Philip Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net, or you may call our toll-free number, and that is 1-800-436-0463. Now, a lot of people are going to our website and contacting us there. We have a contact page there. You can go to www.abibleanswertv.org and contact us by means of our contact page, or you can watch previous programs of A Bible Answer there and also on our YouTube channel. If you have YouTube on your phone, just search for A Bible Answer TV and you'll go right to our YouTube channel and you can watch our programs on your phone or any digital device. Now back to our questions today, and we are ready for Brother Colley. And we have this question. Is all sin equal? I would rather tell a lie than kill someone. Brother Colley. Well, indeed, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Is it just equal for us to lie or to kill? Certainly that's not the case, and yet God defines sin. And all transgression of God's law is sin, 1 John 3, 4. 1 John 5, 17 says all unrighteousness is sin. Now, a lot of times we want to define sin on our own, but we're not allowed to do that. I cannot say which sin is worse, which sin is better. God has to define the sin. I do know that in 1 Timothy 5, it is said that those who provide not for their own are worse than an infidel. So it seems that some sin may be worse than others, and yet all sin will condemn. Romans 6, 23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus His Son. I hope that's helpful to you, but don't lie nor murder. Neither one of them are acceptable in the sight of God. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Brother Colley. And certainly it's the case that sin can differ in its consequences. Uh, murdering someone, the consequences of that would be far greater than uh, perhaps a lie. Brother Colbert, we have this question in Psalm 8, 4, and 5. Are angels higher in rank or level than man? 
for the call of it. Thank you for this good question. It's an interesting question. And so let's read from Psalm 8, beginning at verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. I want in connection with that to turn back to Hebrews chapter 2, a chapter in which the writer is showing how that the angels were greater than Jesus, in a sense. Chapter 1, Christ is above the angels. Chapter 2, Christ is below the angels. Let's notice how that is. In Hebrews 2, in verse 9, but we see Jesus that was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now back in verse 6 in Hebrews 2, for one in a certain place testified, and this is quoting Psalm 8, one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. When we read these passages together, and consider what is said in Genesis 1, 24 through 28, about God creating things upon this earth, and then saying, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, the image of God created he him, male and female created he him. Then he gave them dominion over this. In our text, man and son of man must refer not to an individual, but to the human race, to the human family. And angels are strictly spiritual beings. According to Hebrews 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So they are spiritual beings serving in the spiritual realm. But man was made lower and given dominion over the earth and, and things upon the earth. And when this text says that Jesus was made lower than the angels for the suffering of death, would indicate that the angels were not subject to death. So yes, angels are in a higher rank than, than man. I hope this has been a helpful answer to this question. Thank you, Brother Colbert. To Brother Taylor, how many different kinds or levels of angels are there? Was Lucifer the chief angel? Brother Taylor. Thank you for this good question. Angelology or a study of angels is a fascinating study and it is one that has captured the attention of many, many people. More and more books have been written and are and will be written concerning angels. The basic meaning of an angel is a messenger. First of all, let me approach it negatively. Angels are not God. They are not eternal in nature. God the Father, the first person, is eternal. The second person, who ultimately became the Messiah, or Jesus the Christ, is eternal. 
and the Holy Spirit is referred to in Hebrews 9 and 14 as the eternal spirit. Whenever we talk about the glorious Godhead, we're talking about, we're talking about personalities that are eternal in nature. But angels were created. Since Jesus created everything on earth as the eternal word, as well as things in heaven, that would just simply mean that angels are created beings. As far as the levels are concerned, we read about Michael, and Michael and Gabriel are named angels in the scriptures. Their names occur both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, especially Gabriel and Gabriel in connection with Daniel, and of course Michael in the New Testament in connection with a couple of uh, chapters that deal with him, or at least make a passing reference to him. Michael is referred to as the archangel. And uh, then we have the cherubim and the seraphim. The cherubim are mentioned much more uh, frequently than the seraphim are. Isaiah had some wonderful visions of the upper, of the upper kingdom in Isaiah the sixth chapter in which the word seraphim is used, a reference evidently to heavenly beings that are close to the Father. The Father is spoken of both in the Old Testament and the New Testament as being on the throne. He is the one that occupies that throne and will continue to occupy that throne throughout a never-ending eternity. In regard to uh, angels, uh, evidently there are at least these three ranks, uh, and uh, uh, the angels are not few in number, but uh, almost unlimited in number. There are passages in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well, talking about the great uh, number of angels that have been created. And as Brother Jimmy has suggested from a passage in Hebrews, their ministering servants sent forth to minister those to those who are the heirs of salvation. The latter part of the question deals with Lucifer. Lucifer in Isaiah the 14th chapter does not refer to Satan. Even though Satan is mentioned something like 47 to 50 times in the Bible as Satan, and he's the, the chief of, of uh, the sinners and the head of all sinners, all sin is attributed to him in one sense or another, the one who has inspired people, or rather moved people to do that. Lucifer in Isaiah the 14th chapter is a reference to the Babylonian king, and it's a reference, I believe, to Nebuchadnezzar. We read much about Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, especially in the first few chapters. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar, even though he became a close friend of Daniel, nevertheless, he was a very cruel man a very cruel tyrant lead, uh, uh, heading and uh, being the dominant force in the Babylonian Empire. We see something about the atrocities that he was guilty of or would be guilty of in putting the wise men to death simply because they could not recall a forgotten dream that he had. We see something about the enormity of his evil in Daniel the third chapter when he was willing to take three of the most loyal subjects that he had in all of the empire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he threw them into the burning furnace of fire because they would not bow down to the great golden image that he had made in the early part of this chapter. And so he was an evil man in so many instances, a man of remarkable talents, uh, remarkable ability, but he did not use that remarkable ability to serve the God in heaven as he should have. Lucifer refers to him, the Babylonian king, and not to Satan. Thank you for this good question. Thank you, Brother Taylor, and now to Brother Colley. Satan rebelled against God due to pride. Does this mean that heaven had sin in it then? Brother Colley. I certainly agree with Brother Taylor that the king of Babylon fell from glory and his name is not given, but Lucifer refers to him. But many people pick up on the name Lucifer and think he's talking about Satan, and they say he fell out of heaven. It's always been a difficult thing for me to think that there is any sin at all in heaven, or anything that causes sin. 
It is a place of peace. It is a place of rest. It is a place of eternal joy. And Revelation 21, 27 says, nothing that makes an abomination or a lie is going to enter into it. Now, I realize that indeed all creation God made. And I generally believe He made it on earth. We do not have a record of when the angels were created, but we know God did it. And so in this, maybe we can understand that it is not that which fell out of heaven, but it is that which is on earth. Thank you for the question. We want to thank each one for doing such a great job today in answering these questions. We had several good questions today. The last uh, uh, couple of questions dealing with angels and also with the devil. And we appreciate the ones that have sent them in. There may be some follow-up questions that you may have. You'll see our contact information again at the end of our program today, and you can send us in those questions. There's a song that we sometimes sing which says, Though the way we journey may be often drear, we shall see the King someday. What a joy-filled thought that we shall see the King someday. And of that wonderful day, friends, there is no doubt. Because the Lord promised His followers in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. John 14, verses 2 and 3. What a blessed promise that is. And those who love Him happily look forward to His coming again. But of course, no one knows when that will occur when the day and the hour of His second coming will be. Jesus said in Mark 13, 32, But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. And as the Lord has told us, since we don't know the time, we must watch and pray. Watch and pray. In other words, be prepared for that time when we shall meet the Lord, whenever that time shall be. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.